Hello, everyone. Artificial intelligence has become like a celebrity in the news. Every day we have new news stories on it. Baidu is spending billions of dollars. Google now calls itself an AI-first company. But I'm here to talk about the fact that becoming an artificial intelligence-driven company changes the way we work fundamentally. As CEO of an artificial intelligence company, I'm going to work through some examples of the projects that I've done to give you some idea of how we work with companies and the transformation we see in the work they need to do. I'll start with SMRT. SMRT is Singapore's largest transportation company. Like most transportation companies, it thinks of transportation as assets, physical assets, buses, trains, taxis, shuttle buses. But they were under a lot of competitive disruption from new entrants in the field, like Uber. And so they came to us, how can we change the way we are doing? Can we find a new innovative model? So I went to them, and I said, let's rethink entirely how we think of transportation. Let's think of it as a digital layer that connects all aspects of modality, whether it's a bus or a train, even an autonomous vehicle, and let the consumer decide through a simple app, like an iTunes or a Netflix of transportation. So for the consumer, they can choose from origin to destination, and the app automatically gives them the best package of vehicles for that journey, and they can pay for it seamlessly, completely assured that when they get off that bus, their taxi will be waiting or their bike will already be booked. In such a world, you don't require to own a car. But this was a difficult concept for them to understand, and more than that, to implement. Because while it seems really easy and seamless for the consumer, it is hard at the back end. For the first time, SMRT had to integrate with external partners. They had to integrate with companies from China, autonomous vehicles from Denmark, all different operating units in Singapore to provide this platform. They had to negotiate data access. Who owns the customer? Who gets the commission on a particular ride? But once this was done, despite a lot of the obstacles, I would say thanks to the bold leadership in SMRT, it became a highly successful project. And here are some of the things that we have already integrated with them. Buses, car sharing, taxis, autonomous vehicles. Personalization is a core of artificial intelligence. But to the consumer, it seems easy. But to everyone behind the scenes, it is complicated to build an integrated system. You need to have skills. But these skills are just not technology. These skills require the domain expertise of transport providers and also the negotiating power of these individuals. You know, even governments need to rethink the way they work. Most governments work in silos. Perhaps that's not the case here. But in most governments, it is. You have the land department, the police, the health, the utility. And then you say, some, somebody comes from the top and says, let's be innovative. But it's hard to be innovative. It's good to partner with people who are specialists. For example, Dubai has done something like that. Dubai decided that instead of telling all its agencies to just go and innovate and use artificial intelligence, robotics, and IoT, and good luck with it, they said, we are going to give a grant to startups, and anyone in the world can apply. And when you do, uh, you can then co-create a solution with any agency. And this was a highly successful endeavor. In their first cohort, over 2,000 applicants from 73 companies, countries applied. And in their third cohort, 
so did we. We partnered with Smart Dubai. And I went to them and I said, when I look at Google and search something, and maybe you do, and you do, and you do, we all get different results. We also get different results when we go to Amazon or Netflix. Because those results are personalized to my needs, my habits, my personas. Yet governments insist on treating everybody just the same. I think for governments to be successful, government agencies need to act like leading tech companies, and they need to personalize citizen services. So for example, let's say there's a young woman, her name is Fatma, she's a mother, she's taking some years off and she's currently a housewife. The government wants to tell her about some subsidies related to education. When she looks at her dashboard, these subsidies appear. These subsidies would not appear for a young man who's an entrepreneur and is single. Usually, it's very difficult for citizens to search through the archives of government services and find something that is relevant to them. So this was a challenge that we won. We're now working on a personalization engine. But again, this does not mean that all the people in each of the agencies is not important. In fact, we rely on them to give us the information. And they protect their citizens' data. I think that's very important, to realize that an artificial intelligence team is made up of designers, storytellers, even social scientists. But it's easy for me to say that. What happens to that taxi driver when an autonomous vehicle comes? What happens to the customer service agent who used to tell people about that education subsidy? Well, Singapore has a plan for that. Because Singapore is one of those countries where human capital is, frankly, all we have. Our deputy prime minister said, what if jobs and skills have an expiry date? And Singapore took this question to heart. Singapore is a financial center. It aims to be and continue to be a leading financial center. But it knows that with fintech disruption, a lot of bankers are going to lose their jobs. But it doesn't want to wait to be disrupted. So the first thing it did was the Monetary Authority of Singapore gave hundreds of millions of subsidies to startups and to banks so that they could disrupt themselves effectively. And it gave 27 million to artificial intelligence projects. But then at the same time, it partnered with all its leading universities, like Singapore Management University and MIT, to educate those bankers, re-educate them into becoming fintech entrepreneurs. Because their domain knowledge is important, but now they need to know how to work with technology, how to work with blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and artificial intelligence. I'm a big fan of this approach. And Singapore went beyond that. It said to all its citizens, you have $500. Go and take any course you want. And I'm a citizen, and so I'm going to take a course as well. And it didn't say, you must take a robotics course or a drone course. It said, take any course. I'm going to take a photography course. And the reason is because they understand that when people follow their passion, that's when they love the work they do. And there is not any work in the world anymore that does not involve technology or data or artificial intelligence. And I think that Singapore, with this approach, actually has a global role to pay. Because not only must we change the way work changes because of AI, but even the work of AI. We must be transparent and have ethical use of artificial intelligence. And I have been urging the government to rethink its role as a new Switzerland for AI, a neutral convener of AI experts, not only from the US, Canada, and Europe, but from China, India, Japan, South Korea. There's incredible work happening in all these countries. They need to meet. They need to communicate. 
Now, it's easy to talk about artificial intelligence. In one of the world's richest countries, we all are wearing nice suits, sitting in a nice arena. But my story started in Pakistan, and so I care about him. I think his work is also affected. There are millions of marginal farmers in the world that live between $1 to $4 a day. And they're incredibly vulnerable to all kinds of risks, floods, pests, soil, erosion. Nobody tells them when to sow a particular seed. They use age-old methods that they've been using for centuries. Nobody tells them there's a pest infestation going put fertilizer right here. But with artificial intelligence, we can do that. We are building a new platform that uses remote sensing satellite imagery and artificial intelligence to actually inform farmers ahead of time if there's a pest infestation in a neighboring village, or when they should actually use fertilizer, or when they can expect rain. And we will tell them with mobile phones. So it will fundamentally change the way that they actually do their work. And it is using artificial intelligence. And they can't read, so we have to send them voice messages. But it can make a difference. And so my point here is, there are many problems to solve in the world. And if we focus on creative problem solving, for every job that we lose, with automation and artificial intelligence, there is opportunity for new jobs. What I really enjoyed this whole day, and I traveled the world, was the amount of empathy that I heard on the stage today from everyone who spoke. And I think that's very important to remember at all times. Another thing that I thought was interesting about the European Union, coming back to changing the way we do artificial intelligence, is the new General Data Protection Regulation coming out. There's an article there, Article 22. And it says, if an algorithm made a decision that significantly affected your life, such as a student loan or a house loan, then you have the right to ask for an explanation. Now, for artificial intelligence, that's complicated because we deal in black boxes. If you give me thousands of pictures, I can tell you if it's a cat or a dog. But we tend not to explain why. There's a new field called explainable AI that actually reveals its inner workings. And more fields like this are coming. These are governance policy making that we must do when we deal with artificial intelligence. I was also very happy to hear a number of people talk about women. The head of Smart Dubai is a woman. The head of the equivalent is a woman. I met some women in Norway yesterday who were very inspiring. But still, I am often the only woman having an artificial intelligence conversation in a room full of men. Um, and I hope that will change. And in that effort, I have started a charity in Singapore where we have partnered with Google and we provide free coding classes to girls. And we are helping thousands of girls learn to solve problems. It is not about the technology. It is about the problem. Here, the girls are working on a FinTech peer-to-peer -peer app. But they don't even know those words. And they don't need to. All they need to know is they're figuring out a way to lend each other money over a mobile app. And so that is what excites me about artificial intelligence, is the potential to do good, the potential for our youth to learn. And I think there is a gap. I believe Singapore has a role to play. I believe Norway has a role to play. Norway has many industries in which it can do leadership. My PhD research is based on the papers of many Norwegian professors from the University of Oslo. So I know that you have fantastic researchers in this country. And I also know that there's a global role to be played by Norway, a role that's important. That artificial intelligence, if you do it right, actually can be equitable and just. That some people will lose their jobs, 
but some efficiency will happen and new opportunities will be created and we will protect those for some time and help them find new jobs when they are lost. I urge Norway to take on this role. I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you.